when they don't work from a studio, when there isn't really a, a, a cut off, a divide between um, where work begins, you know, leaving the home to go to a specific um, place that's designed for work and, and in the home where that can be a little bit more fluid and when there's more kind of porosity between what belongs to work and what belongs to the rest of everyday life. So I, I think that I was experiencing that myself, although really that's only something that I've kind of realised in the last couple of months, uh, that that's a kind of un undergrowing influence. Um, but uh, uh, so one of the, the things was from my, as a, as a critic working in Berlin, I've always found that kind of one of the most interesting parts of that is, is the studio visit or visiting an artist where they work and getting a sense of not only the artworks as they're presented in an exhibition but also everything that surrounds them, the kind of environment that they come out of and all of this kind of peripheral material. Uh, so that, that was kind of fed into, into this interest but then the kind of ultimate catalyst I would say as I was telling you before um, was when I was approached by World of Interiors magazine who wanted me to, they had this idea that they wanted to do a story about Tacita Dean's apartment and Tacita lives in Berlin in a kind of typical old Berlin apartment from the 1900s um, and uh, they, so they sent me, they asked me to contact Tacita and I wrote her an email and said, you know, could, could we do this and she wrote back and said, well, my apartment is, uh, is, is a horrific mess, you know, <laughs> but I'll see if I can tidy a corner and come along and see what you think. So I went over and it really was just absolutely full of clutter. Every single surface was piled up with books and objects and materials and, and children's toys and there was really just this kind of incredible dense landscape. Um, but then over the kind of t couple of hours that I spent there talking with her, uh, it became clear that almost everything around us was related to her work in some way. She had this kind of anecdotes to uh, ex explain that she was kind of un unpicking this landscape and it related very closely to her work. And this kind of got me thinking then about this, um, this kind of porosity then between an artist's work and the place in which it transpires. Um, but uh, needless to say, World of Materials didn't want to run the story in the end. I think as I've uh, read through some of the, in some of, maybe what courses through all of the maybe case studies, I think as you call them, um, of the chapters and the different kinds of artist dwelling spaces, is everybody seems to be in, in some way or another captivated by a kind of an idea about oscillation, about whether it's between pu publicness and privateness, or interior and exterior, or dream life and, and real life. And I think that's also something that's this sort of in-betweenness is something that really fascinates us in our own, in our work. We, we talk about it a little bit um, as a kind of twilight condition that isn't dark and isn't, isn't day. And I, I think, of course, some of the references, for example, the discussion about Eraflos, the notion of the facade um, as the kind of ultimate barrier between the public, the public life, let's say, of the city and the inner life of the house was quite fascinating, but I really appreciated how you talked about, related to the facade, how you talked about the window in the case of Katarina's, Katarina Grosny's house in Berlin. And I thought maybe you could talk a little bit more about um, that, how you know, she, we, or she, Mark and I, and Lily are also friends with Katarina, and she commissioned a house in this case. Uh, and I think we, we were, as Kirsty and I were talking earlier before meeting today, that she's such an incredibly articulate woman and an artist, and how she, imagine her house in relationship both to her own workspace but also in relationship to the city I thought was really was really poignant. Um, yeah Katerina Grossa she's a she's a painter um, she lives in Berlin I don't know how familiar uh, you are with her work although I know she spent has spent some time in LA um, but she her her work itself like as well as uh, making having a kind of camp practice that's based on canvas uh, work, she also is kind of maybe better known for these spray painted installations where she kind of uh, will spray whatever the uh, surfaces of the institution, of the, the host of the exhibition. So her work has always been really a lot to do with, with kind of art articulating a surface or 
um, the boundaries, how she describes it as the boundaries between an, ob an object and their host environment, between the foreground and the background. And um, in, in her case, when I was looking at her house in Berlin, I was really interested in how this kind of abstract idea that uh, appears in her work was translated into this house. And she's actually one of the not so many examples in my book of, of a, like herself, but she didn't build it herself, but she commissioned this architecture. Um, and when she had the opportunity, she found a plot of land in Berlin, she had the opportunity to build a house that was to be a living and working space. Um, she was very clear that she wanted it to be quite, she wanted it to be very visible. She said she wanted to be as visible um, within the kind of urban landscape in Berlin as the, as the uh, pizza parlor or the gas station that people would like drive along the road and know that that was, that was the house where the artist lives. Um, and it is a very striking house, there'll be some pictures of it at some point, but I don't think we've got to them yet. It's this kind of uh, very severe looking concrete cube that's on a kind of corner plot of land on this quite leafy kind of residential street in the center of Berlin. Um, and when she, she spoke to various architects and, uh, in, in Berlin and then in fact decided who she wanted to work with on it, um, and basically gave them a list of the square footage that she would need for each of these areas of her living and working practice for storage and for administrative space, for studio space and for living. And the only other um, uh, advice or, or condition that she told them was that she didn't want to have any transitional spaces, that, that each of these roles should move very directly from from one space to the next, um, and uh, and so she ended up with this with this concrete cube that looks quite formidable, but it also has this quite uh, unusual arrangement of windows that don't necessarily, where when you see them from the outside, they don't necessarily correspond to what where you would imagine the rooms and the floors to be on the inside, but they're very large, kind of these large cuts cutouts in the concrete facade, and so what they do afford you is this kind of very direct view into whichever rooms, you know, so you have this, especially at night time, you have this very uh, kind of direct view into the office space, and so it becomes very um, uh, literally transparent what she's doing in these, in these spaces, and for me then that had this kind of uh, relation to the way that she works in, in, in wanting to articulate this kind of permeability between objects and foreground and background. I thought it was really powerful how she spoke about permeability and the idea that almost campuses, windows, everything became a, kind of a, an aperture into something else. This kind of desire for transformation was, was really quite poetically talked about, I guess, in your dialogue with her. Um, I think, you know, I, I, one of the things that struck me in, in the conversation between you and your observations about the artist's work, maybe in opposition to how an architect um, talking about or envisioning the space was that uh, maybe in a way that Ripper talked really precisely about the idea of the frame, the idea that you create a kind of framework and, and if it's strong and clear, it allows for a kind of diversity and almost a chaos to unfold, but that there's still something uh, coherent about the experience of, of space. And I think so many architects are so aspiring to so much control on the way that they envision space and how it is occupied. And I think that's something, as you talk about almost in the introduction, that the idea that the, the peripheral, the sort of most intimate parts of, of one's daily life, which happens in mostly in the domestic environment, is really the sort of kernel of, of the creative act and really how one experiences space. So I, I, I think that it's, it's right that maybe in Katrina's house, it seems very um, severe, yet when you experience it, and the idea that there are no walls, there are no corridors, the sort of flow of activity is very, is very, it's very fluid, and there's, there aren't sort of hard boundaries. And I think that's something that courses through a lot of the way artists live in their, live in their environments. In particular, and in the case of Monica's house, and, and yeah, and um, it's in Warsaw, her house. Yes. Yes. Um, it's another one of the case studies where she and her partner commissioned, again, I guess another commissioned project, but I thought it was really powerful that 
it was a slightly peripheral um, site in the city, and so the idea of sort of making an enclave, making a hard edge, so that they could have a very flexible way of migrating almost around the house, was maybe another almost extreme case of, so instead of one house, in the case of Katarina, it was actually four different buildings inside this, this very yeah. austere. I might just flick back to those yeah. pictures and then it becomes a little <coughs> clearer what we're talking about, because they just, they just occurred. Okay, yeah. This, so this is Monika Sosnowska's house. She's a Polish sculptor. Um, this is her house in Berlin, and this uh, in Warsaw, I should say. This building on the right is her neighbor's house, and her house begins with this very severe, another very severe kind of gray wall, which is the facade, essentially, of her, of her property. And then beyond the facade, she has this small plot of land. There's four separate little houses. So. Um, you know, there's a lot of similarities and with the way that Katerina Grosser approached her commission. Um, here there's, uh, directly behind the facade is the studio, there's one little unit to the right which is, um, that's the studio, one little right, one little building is the home, there's one building that's a garage and then in the back there's another little building that's the, that's the guest apartment. You know, and I was quite uh, interested again in Sydney trying to find a kind of point of contact between the way that she approaches her sculpture, which has a lot to do with actually the communist, the legacy of communist architecture in Poland and these kind of institutional spaces and the interior as this kind of uh, um, loaded with kind of political ideological resonance and kind of oppressive space. So I found like this uh, solution was kind of like the opposite of that. The outside looks like this very severe kind of ideologically determined architecture, but then if you go into any of these rooms, they're kind of incredibly light and very with very simple materials and very kind of um, so in a way she's exercising all of that kind of communist uh, architectural ideal. It's yeah, it's super ephemeral. If you if you look at it from from one of these views, you can hardly um, you, you can't really believe that. But there's also there's always this tra kind of transition between these these kind of severe brutalist exterior views and these kind of very crunchy gravel paths and also the fact that it's Warsaw, you know, it's, the weather is terrible in the winter, you always have to go, you know, with an umbrella through the snow or the kind of melting rain. Well, that's, now we're on to something else, but... <laughs> um, yeah, so, so for me that was fascinating and actually she is very much in denial that it has anything to do with her work. She says, no, for me it's not a sculpture, but it's such an extreme way to decide to live that, uh, yeah, I felt like there were quite close analogies to the trauma. I mean, one of the other maybe connections we felt to the impetus in the case of Monica or Katrina or many of the other ways that artists talked maybe more conceptually about the inner life of their, their dwelling and, and the space outside of it is that in our case we're, we're, we're not only thinking about the building, but we're always almost thinking about the building in the city, the idea of the context and as the makers of the things. And I think that's why, let's say, the example of Lois that you talked about, Adolf Lois was a Viennese architect, and practicing in the turn of the century Vienna. And for him, the importance of the facade, it was almost a kind of sense of decorum, that you had a certain way that you needed to present yourself in context, not to show off, but to have a certain kind of continuity, but that gave the possibility for uh, exuberance in the inner life of the house. And I think that that is, courses through a lot of the, the, the projects and is such a, you know, for us, such a powerful architectural problem. So just, I guess, reading, reading the book for me and, and think, looking at all the different precedents, it really reinforced the kind of importance of the connection of the artistic practice to, to you know, really thinking precisely about the space of the individual as the kernel of making architecture. Yeah, I mean, for me, I was really thinking a lot about um, about you know the banal materials of the everyday. You know, one of the, uh, the as they kind of form this kind of interior landscape, and one of the um, writers that I kept coming back to was Georges Perec, and he 
describes this so beautifully, particularly in this one book called Species of Spaces and Other Pieces, where he kind of does this forensic analysis of his working table, for instance, or, or analyzes um, this kind of backward zoom from the, from the bedroom to the apartment, to the street, to the world. And he, he um, comes up with this kind of terminology for, for the everyday, the quotidian material that makes up the, say, the landscape, the domestic material. He talks about the infraordinary. And, um, and, and this, for me, was something that kept coming up again and again. So initially, then, with Tessit and Dean, how these totally ordinary things could then be a kind of a passageway to some great story that relates very closely to some of her work. Um, and in many of the examples and in my book, and if you have a flick through it and look at some of the pictures, you'll see that a lot of the, the imagery and a lot of the interiors that are pictured are very ordinary looking. You know, they look as, as ordinary as our, many of our own apartments. Um, but for me, I was interested in these situations when that um, nevertheless becomes kind of imbued with this resonance, which is something that, for instance, in Francis Starr's work happens is very... Uh, particularly and it's very precisely kind of focused on. Um, or another kind of, for me, fascinating example was uh, Dominique Gonzalez Foster, who was somebody that I was very much kind of lodged in my brain and I knew that I really, she was uh, super important. Yeah, uh, hard time and, tracking her down. Yeah, she, I'd heard so many stories about front of Dominique Gonzalez Foster's house and how she lived and um, she had this, uh, this, this this one house that I kept hearing about that she made, was making in collaboration with, with the Swiss architect Philippe Bam, that was to, to be the super experimental somewhere in the countryside outside Paris where um, the, the organization of the rooms was to, to be determined by the temperature of, of the, the kind of ideal temperature for each room's function and it was a very kind of cerebral project. Like, searching in the internet and trying to find where it could be and what images of it existed and uh, actually it turned out that she never made it, it was never made but it was this kind of very complex long ongoing um, conversation that she had with, with Philippe Ram and there were various diagrams and kind of fascinating um, material that they developed together but it really never went beyond this kind of cerebral um, uh, situation. Um, and then, uh, but, but, so I finally managed to track her down, get her on the telephone and start asking her about this and about other projects. And for me, I knew that the, the uh, interior, oh look, this is, this is her, this is, that's correct, this is Tony Gonzalez Foster's house. Um, so for her, the interior had always been really um, important in her work. This is a piece that she made in the early 90s, which is a recreation of her parents' bedroom as she imagined it. Um, and she talks a lot about the interior as being, or the, or the home as being a kind of self-conscious self biography in some sense. Um, and uh, so I finally got her on the phone and was asking her about her apartment. And she was telling me about her apartment in Paris that she'd lived in for 20 years, but had since left. Um, and how, when she moved out of it, she and her daughter, they basically each packed a suitcase and then moved to their new apartment and left it exactly as it had been. And they hadn't, she hadn't changed anything for the next two years. And the way she was describing it, I was kind of totally fascinated with it and absolutely wanted to go and visit it. And this is actually, this and the slide before was what I had then went to visit. It was a very ordinary apartment situation full of all these this kind of, well, now on to something else, but full of, full of this, Clutter, but she, the way that she, you know, it looked very ordinary, and again, a little bit similar to the Tessa Dean situation. Once she started talking about it and describing it, it became clear that it was really a kind of imaginary space for her. You know, when she goes back there, she doesn't live there anymore, but it still has this resonance to do with having lived there and made this kind of twenty-year body of work. Um, and yeah, I mean, I can't really go into that in too much detail now, but. Describe it. Yeah, what's really beautifully written about the book, and I, I love the way she, you know, she just basically it seemed like on the end of the Philippe Brown project. She, not that she maybe ever envisioned building that, building that, but that she just said, I need to live among the, the world of the contingent. I, I just, I can't have that kind of control. Yeah. 
mean, she was really horrified actually with the idea of moving into a purpose-built architecture, like a, a frame that was designed to fit her needs. So. <laughs> Um, maybe another, maybe shifting scale a little bit. I guess we're going to talk a little more, and then maybe we'll have questions. Um, was at the end of the, the the later chapters of the book where Kirsty starts to almost shift scale, where it begins to shift into almost thinking of the house as a as a space of exhibition or in a museum. I guess in some of the examples, and I think. Maybe Hans Ulrich is one of the really strong examples in the book of, of a curator who who really celebrates that sort of the everydayness of these more bleak kinds of environments to create exhibition spaces. And I think that it's it's so fascinating to to consider. Uh, right now, we're working on a small museum project at the Manila campus in Houston, which is um, a really small building, maybe a, a large house size by LA standards about 30,000 square feet for a, a museum for drawing. So in a way, it's, it's really at the scale of a house. And I think going back to the kind of beginning of the thesis, the idea that this, this sort of peripheral everydayness is the kernel of, of the most intimate way we all engage space, whether it's a house or a museum, is so beautifully captured in a lot of the examples in the last chapter of the book where um, the exhibition, I can't remember the curator's name now, in, in Ghent, I think, where he took like 50 paintings and install them in different homes around the city as the exhibition. So maybe you can talk about some of the um, Yeah, just to give you a sense of how the book's structured, then it's divided into um, five chapters, each of which yeah. has four artists' kind of case studies in them. And it, it kind of proposes a narrative, basically, from the home as a as an intimate domestic space, so starting with the bedroom, and then it moves to the idea of the home as a workshop and talks about the kitchen table as a kind of metaphor for this idea of the home being kind of repurposed as a workshop. And then um, I look at uh, the kind of doors and window, windows as these possible apertures that can either um, articulate a transition between private and public or create a total interior. Um, and then I talk about the facade, which we talked about a little bit already, and then the last chapter is then looks, looks at these situations when an artist takes their home and then exhibits it in some way. And there's a lot of examples from the 60s onwards of an, of an artist taking the contents of their home or a room of their home and then recreating it in a gallery and a public situation. Um, and then Lucas Samaras did that, Beautiful Concha did that both in the 1960s and the many more recent examples of that. But then there's this, also this opposite tendency of um, artists to uh, open their homes to the public, you know, for their homes to be some kind of surrogate museum or exhibition space. And this, in this example of, uh, from 1986 where Jan Hoort curated this incredible kind of groundbreaking exhibition called Chambre d'Amis where uh, he's from Ghent in Belgium, he was the curator of the museum in, in Ghent and he organized this group show which he described as, as, as cutting the museum to pieces and scattering it throughout the town and he convinced the residents in 50 or so different homes in Ghent to essentially host an artwork in their home by in many conceptual artists as well. So. Uh, for, for the period of this exhibition, then the whole uh, town became the museum, essentially. And there was this kind of uh, great possibility to view uh, Daniel Buren that somebody had painted in their bedroom, you know. And also, you know, the flip side of that is that these residents then got to live with these kind of fascinating pieces for the duration of that show. Um, and uh, so I was thinking about this and thinking about these kind of uh, um, four artists where that seemed kind of salient, one of whom was Domini gonzalez Foster, and then another was, was Rickrit Tiravinit, who, um, although he has a fantastic kind of self-architected house in Chiang Mai, and actually the film that was playing before with the cats uh, is the film that he made following his cats around his house in Chiang Mai for six hours. It's kind of, he was actually filming. He was filming them, and so for me, in a way, that that film is like, you know, it's like a self-portrait of Rickard at work, you know, when the, 
the cats asleep in the corner for an hour and a half, then Rick Rick's also pretty much sitting there doing nothing for an hour and a half, and everyone kind of, yeah, it's very uh, um, appealing, I think. But, um, but I, I don't actually write about that house in, in my book. The house that I fun, uh, focus on is his apartment in New York that he's lived in since 1982. Uh, that uh, he, when he first moved to New York, he found it and lived there with a couple of roommates and has um, uh, kept kept it on, although he travels all over the world. It's just kind of his, his anchor, in a sense. Um, and it's this apartment that he's then rebuilt in various exhibition spaces, kind of notoriously, first of all in Cologne in the Kunstverein in 1996, and then subsequently in Gavin Brown's gallery in New York in 1999, where I was working at the time, so I kind of experienced that very close quarters, which was quite an uh, intense, um, intense exhibition period, because the, the apartment was recreated to scale, built in plywood and installed in the gallery with running water, with electricity, and so it became kind of the host to these kind of surrogate domestic activities that were then imported and took, took, took place there in the, in the space in the museum. And, then, and he went on to, to build his apartment in various other situations, and I, um, for me, it kind of, thinking about it, it, kind of took on this kind of quite melancholy resonance, you know, that it was like this kind of, snail shell in a way that was following him around as he was on this kind of ever more uh, frantic nomadic existence and he would always rebuild this as this kind of ur form of his work as this kind of structural framework um, that, that could potentially be recreated you know up to infinity but it's never a real home you know it's always just a figure of a home and whatever um, whatever people do there is also not really, ha it's, you know, they're not really sleeping in their home or having a bat in their own bed. You know, they would be doing those things in, in their own domestic situation. So it, it took on this kind of uh, distance, kind of slightly melancholy distance resonance for me. <laughs> having been very close, so far away. Well, this, um, this is Katarina Gross's house, by the way. Um, that's Katarina looking out of her window. So, I mean, I could talk about this subject all night long and tell a lot of stories, but maybe, maybe there's some questions from the audience. If anybody has a question about a particular artist or a, pi a picture that you've seen that you don't know what it was, Yeah, and, and actually that was something that when uh, when I first started thinking about the idea of the artist's house, it became very quickly apparent to me that I wasn't really just interested in looking at mid-career artists who got to a certain point that they were able to build an impressive architectural structure, you know, to kind of demonstrate their success. Um, and, you know, although we've talked a lot about artists who have um, build their own home situations. The majority of the artists that I look at in the book, um, uh, that, that's not the case. There is really more about a working practice that, that takes place in the domestic interior. That, you know, whatever, whatever that might have been, in a lot of those cases, it was really a means to an end, you know, as well. Artists who weren't able to afford to have a separate studio so that by default, the home became their working situation. Um, and in particular, one of the artists who was very influential, again, to my thinking, who's not, he's not one of the case studies because his house doesn't exist as such anymore, but um, Felix Gonzalez Torres was, he, he described himself as a kitchen table artist, you know, and he was really adamant that, that his work really came out of this, um, this kind of porous, everyday domestic situation. Uh, and although at the beginning this was really, he was working in New York, he didn't have any money, he couldn't afford a studio, but he, he uh, later on in his career when um, it was, that would have been more available to him, he, he was uh, very committed to kind of retain 
this kind of working practice where it wasn't cut off, where there wasn't any divide between, um, you know, a home, home life, everyday life, what's private and what's public. And then, that, you know, clearly in his work, then that's a very um, important uh, theme throughout his work. Uh, this is Andrea Zetel's house in Joshua Tree. Do you recognize the landscape? Okay. Um, yeah, Andrea Zetel, I'm sure a lot of you know, she's a more or less local artist, but it's for her the whole idea of investigative living and uh, turning the kind of, or examining the routines of everyday life and, uh, as the kind of material of a um, conceptual art making practice. The scope of your book, is it, um, do you go to India or Africa or Asia? I'm just curious, the geographics of it. Yeah, the geographics of it were very much determined by my budget, actually, so I don't. Um, uh, I, I received a grant from the, um, from the Warhol Foundation, but it, was, it wasn't <laughs> so extensive that I could travel so far. So uh, does, it's really European based. There's a, Few artists from the states. There's an artist from Mexico, but it's but it's really um, artists who are more close at hand to me, and also uh, you know a lot of artists who that I was already quite familiar with their work. You know, so it was, it was several of the artists I found out about and visited specifically for the purpose of the book. But there's also a, a large number of them who um, whose work I who, who I'd worked with before, whose work I'd written about before and who I've been thinking about for quite a long time. So that was also important for me. I'm not, with this book, I wasn't really trying to um, make a kind of definitive statement about this subject, which anyway, I think is not really possible. Um, and it's, it's, it's quite a subjective interpretation, and if you read some of the chapters in it, you can kind of get a sense of that, that it's um, uh, not, it's, yeah. I mean, I think that you, that would be a very interesting opportunity to write a book that, or the similar subject matter that deals with artists in, in other parts of the world. But she'd had uh, the architect that she chose to work with, who's a Polish architect but had been living in Switzerland, she'd had been having conversations with him for years before about architecture, you know, so they, she already knew that, that, that they were thinking about things in the same way, and I think that that's, um, you know, that's a kind of ground rule that there had to be some kind of basic understanding, and in their case it was a conceptual understanding. But, she chose to work with him, but he wasn't based in Warsaw, so then she found another architect who was based in Warsaw to be the project manager, and actually uh, she was very diplomatic about it, but from other people I heard that it was a complete disaster, and it was a very complicated building project because there were too many voices involved, and uh, it, 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 it became like a never-ending disastrous building site. But um, 
yeah, I mean, I think it really depends a lot from, from case to case. I think there's a lot of potential for it to be a real disaster. One of the things just related to that that I found interesting, um, talking with Katarina about how she, the genesis of that project was that she she almost described her own daily rituals of a practice of, of working and arriving, and she gave areas, but it was very, there was no, it seemed to me, as she described, there was no vision she was putting forward. It was a very, almost like a recipe of relationships, and that was it. So it was very precise, but, but very open at the same time. Yeah, I think that that's probably really important to, for, to, to have a kind of pragmatic approach. I think as an artist, we go into it with a pragmatic approach, then the chances of it uh, finding a good resolution are probably greater. But uh, um, with Gabriel Roscoe, for instance, he, you know, he's like the opposite of that because he, his house that he built in uh, on the coast in Mexico is a design basically that he borrowed from another building in India, so he, that he sees as a sculpture. He sees that very clearly as a, um, a sculpture, and not like this wonderful beach house which might appear to the rest of us. Um, and so he, the architect that he worked with, who actually I didn't speak to, but I think that she was essentially she's based in Mexico City and she basically had to make this happen, you know, so that was a very different, I think that her creative input was, was very limited, so yeah, that's the, the other variation. Hi, I'm curious about artists you visited with and thought about who would be maybe either built or um, whether a commission building or not uh, made a situation that's more of a experiment in a social sense, and I'm thinking of who's not really that's an artist, an architect, like the Schindler residence here in LA, where it was built to have two couples who lived and worked in that space. I mean, maybe Andrea Zatel's Joshua Tree residence is something close to that, but I'm curious what other examples are. Things you've looked at. Um, you know, actually, most of the artists that I look at in my book are really more concerned with a solitary practice. You know, and the, they're using their home in that in that way, except for Andrea and Andrea. Although even even her, you know, the uh, the house itself, even even though her um, larger project in Josh, Joshua Tree involves you know uh, a larger social group, like the house itself, which is kind of like a work, also this kind of workshop where she develops prototypes that go on to be. Possibly, you know, the possible works that could be possibly exhibited. Um, um, but the mo you know, the majority of the artists that I that I uh, that I look at are really dealing with a more kind of solitary situation. Although Rick Rick would be so another Rick Rick was a good example. Yeah, Rick Rick was another example of you, yeah, using his apartment as a framework for this idea of social engagement. Yeah, the land I don't go into, but that in, in my book, but that's also it, it, exactly it's this idea of a kind of domestic situation that has a broader, um, like residency element to it. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I'm not. I don't exactly know what situation it's in right now because it's this kind of loosely evolving project. You know, the land is. Uh, essentially, this project that Rick Rick organized in Thailand, in the countryside outside of Chiang Mai, where he invited various artists to build a structure there that would be then used as a kind of residency, as the basis of a residency program. Um, but, you know, as is kind of typical with the way Rick Rick works, it's a very loose framework. <laughs> It's not a, a, a rigid structure, and I think that the, the you know there's all sorts of aspects of that that are not very well defined, such as the funding aspects. And I think that it's never really uh, uh, like in comparison with the Schindler residency, for example. You know, it doesn't have this um, functional structure that enables it to work as an ongoing residency system. But I think that it's something that Rick Ritz kind of developing, and he's working a lot with local artists and uh, and people that he knows there to kind of find a way to make it sustain itself, basically. But uh, I'm not, I don't know exactly what the current status of it is.
Yeah, the Orof so Orofsko's house um, is he he basically took this design. This is a cruciform um, architectural structure with a circle, like a he half hemisphere in the in the middle, um, that he's made into a, a diving pool. But he borrowed this structure from a building, from a scientific building in in New Delhi. This 18th century, this is 18th century compound buildings that were designed um, as astronomical instruments, essentially. And he went there many, many years ago, and he loved it and saw it. Was sitting on the edge of the of this pool that's not actually filled with water the, in the original. It's inscribed with these markings in stone that are used to to you know read the stars. And he's sitting on the edge and dangling his legs in there and with his wife, and thought, oh hey, this would be such a great pool, this is such a great beach house, and I had this idea in his head for many years, and um, this area in on the Pacific coast in Mexico is a place where he used to go camping, and finally found this piece of land and decided this was exactly the right spot to realize this, this house. Um, and it is the most amazing kind of fantastic ephemeral uh, building because it has these four rooms, in, one in each of these cruciform areas, and it's nestled into the rock, and it just has the rolling ocean all around it. It's completely isolated. <clears throat> but he talks about it in really, as it were, you know, he's very adamant that it's a sculpture. And in fact, he, not just a sculpture, but he calls it an instrument, an instrument of observation. Because when you're there and you're actually on this roof, then everything kind of disappears and you're really at one with you know, the nature around him. So, um, would he still spend any time there? So, well, he lives in New York and he's very, he has a son, so he's very tied down by kind of school schedules, but he goes there you know, twice a year or something like that. But the nice thing about this house is that the rooms all lock up and then it just becomes this kind of structure that's open to the element and the rain rains into the pool and you know he also designed it with this in mind that it could just be uninhabited for 10 years and kind of sink into the landscape and then you could go back and unlock the door and it would still be still be inhabitable. I have a question. I, I, it's sort of like a a memory I have of like first coming to Berlin and meeting, I met um, Franz Ackermann like in 96 or 7, and I got this argument with him about, uh, which then I like made an imprint in my brain that was um, dividing like the sort of European sensibility versus American sensibility because he, I said something about, you know, I don't know, wanting to be domestic or something, and he was like, oh, you American artist, that you want to do this sort of bourgeois, like, like create your home. I think he was kind of responding at the time. Jorge was building his CV Lane, and he sort of described this view of being an artist that didn't have a home, that traveled, stayed in hotels, and he was doing those mental map, sort of like it were related to tourist uh, photography. And at the time, but it was really, really, uh, he was really, really, ang almost a little bit angry, like that you would buy something. He's bought himself a really big house. <laughs> <laughs> so you know. And he, really, he really convinced me that Europeans didn't do that. Like they didn't buy things. They couldn't get love homes. But it is true, actually, especially in Germany, that um, that the, there isn't this thing of being a homeowner. You know, that's, that's so important, and actually, that Jorge talks about very much in relation to his. C. Du Lane project, but it was also about home ownership. Yeah. This kind of this America, this goal of American way of life. But in, in in Germany, that's not really. You know, a lot of people rent their homes for their whole lives. Yeah, I guess I'm curious as if you found in all your research that there well, the renting versus owning, and if that reflected back on the artistic uh, practice and like a sort of political sensibility about who you were in the schema, because I mean these giant, like the ghetto or stuff, it just looks like like fantastical, uh, huge amounts of money were put yeah, into this. Yeah. And um, the, I guess this sort of more, uh, if there was like a kind of relationship between how the art artists wanted to like kind of mythologize themselves 
either as a sort of Marxist, uh, socially conscious person, were they renting, or if there was any kind of correlation, or if you found <coughs> hypocrisy within that or not. I mean, a, a lot of the artists that I look at, um, you know, like the, the Felix Gonzalez Torres idea again, that, 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 that it really didn't even matter if you were owning, or it, it wasn't about the, um, the building or the apartment per se, it was really more about it being a vessel. You know? And um, in, in, you know, if you're building an architectural structure such as Jorge or Gabriel or, you know, even uh, Monica or, or Katrina, then that has to do with a certain degree of uh, success and age and, you know, responsibility of taking. But many, there's several artists that I, uh, that I deal with who Dominique Gonzalez Foster is one example where the apartment, this apartment that she lived in for 20 years, she doesn't own that apartment, she rents it and it was, she, um, it was in this newly built uh, building in the 19th uh, arrondissement in Paris and in many of these buildings they would like set aside the top floor for artists and you could apply to be awarded it and she was, she was awarded it and um, still, you know, still has it and it was means tested so, you know, for her, for her kind of owning or renting didn't come into it. Maybe she is an example then of this kind of European mentality where it's really more about uh, uh, using what you have and being mobile, not necessarily about it being possession. Um, and then there's two other artists where there's the same, that was the same uh, situation, Edward Krajinski from Warsaw, who's a kind of surreal conceptualist artist working in the 60s and 70s, and he again was living on the top floor of this communist block in Warsaw that had been set aside and for kind of artists and writers and intellectuals, and he stayed there his whole life, and now um, he died in 2004, but now it's been turned into a kind of foundation and been preserved um, in, in his name. Um, so, I mean, I think that, that, that that's definitely kind of a latent issue yeah. with housing. It was like the British apartments and Mark's apartment. Were those they're rented? Yeah, Mark's apartment is rented. Mark Kamil Shanovitz, he's one of the videos playing over here. He was again, in fact, this video was shot again. One of the, it was a, it was a, a house. Uh, he had one floor of a house in the East End. Um, and these houses have been set for demolition and they've been given to a, a housing association for a short period of time and uh, the housing association was allowed to let artists live and work there for this period before they were demolished and so this uh, it was on approach road and this um, period in Mark Camille Shankett's life was this was kind of the kernel of all of his subsequent work was made in this kind of temporary situation which had this kind of short lifespan when he knew it was going to be torn down but then he uh, when he had to leave at the end of the 70s he um, then found an apartment in Camberwell to buy but this was like 1979 and you know the, the housing market was not anything like it is now so this was not uh, necessarily I mean I think it's very difficult to see that in the same terms as like house ownership now where it's been so much about become so much about speculation. Also in the backdrop of this argument I have with Franz Ackerman that I was in Kreuzberg at the uh, Italian residency and there were around Kreuzberg there were all these squat situations with many, many I, people who call themselves artists, I don't know if they but the same kind of artists, but it is do you feel like that is that still happening? Like the squatter I think there's fewer and fewer opportunities for that. That's certainly in Berlin, like a lot of those squats have been removed, although that one in Britannia is, is, is still there. Uh, I mean, it's not, it's not really something I went into. There's a certain kind of precarity with that yeah. that makes it difficult to get close to. But uh, I mean, it's slightly related, but not, not totally. Um, Maybe it, it's an interesting anecdote that after I don't know how many years that Katrina was living and working in the building that she commissioned, she kind of felt she had to leave. So she, she still works there, but she's now living in another building, which is, um, I mean, it's an old supermarket and it's 
very connected to the garden, and somehow it felt like she, it just became a studio, and she couldn't live there anymore. And she lives in a much more sort of provisional, casual, almost undefined environment with the beautiful garden outside. So. Neil that was made by the filmmaker Michel Odea um, over a period of, of several years, beginning I think in 1979 up to um, no, maybe a bit earlier, 76 to 82, I think something like that. Um, and it's kind of a documentary, a very kind of a loose documentary about her working practice, her home-based working practice. Uh, the second video is Mark Hamil Shanovitz. It's called Partial Views of an Interior, and it's from 1976 and shot then in this apartment that he uh, reconfigured in um, East London on Approach Road. Uh, the next one around is a PowerPoint piece by Andrea Zatel. Uh, it was quite an early piece from around 2002 when she first moved to Joshua Tree, and it's called uh, self-sufficient, I think, and it's about her kind of attempt to set up this self-sufficient living situation in Joshua Tree. And then the next, the last monitor has two videos by Mark Necky, both of which were shot and kind of about this situation of his working in his apartment on Wimble Street in London. So have a look at those before we And have something to eat. And ask me any questions if you like, privately. Thanks so much for coming.